Welcome to the Disciple Science Podcast. We are fortunate today to be joined by Reverend Kyle Meyard Skop, who serves as the national organiz organizer and spokesman for Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Kyle holds an undergraduate degree in religious studies from Calvin College in Michigan and a master's in divinity from Western Theological Seminary. And he is ordained in the Christian Reformed Church in North America. Uh, Kyle's professional work involves integrating theology, science, and action toward a deeper awareness of Christian responsibility to care for God's earth and to love one's neighbor. Kyle, I'm so glad to have you uh, aboard today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Yeah. So um, uh, as we have discussed, you know, we like to schedule these interviews to coincide with um, some of our video releases. And by the time this comes out, we should have released a video talking about this intersection of, of uh, Christianity and creation care and uh, some of the complexities of, of dominion and stewardship. And, and as we just heard in your bio, this is what you've dedicated your career to. But this is a little bit of an um, now, I think to most listeners of Disciple Science, they'd be very comfortable with this, but many Christians would think this is an odd marriage between uh, someone who's ordained and someone who cares deeply about, uh, about caring for God's creation. Can you just give us a little bit about your background and tell us how you got interested in, in this specific focus? Certainly. So I grew up in a, a beautiful Christian home uh, that taught me much about what it is to love Jesus, to uh, pursue Christ's kingdom, um, to love my neighbor. Um, but it didn't have a whole lot to teach me about what my faith had to do with the natural world around me. Mm. Uh, that began to change when my older brother, who uh, I love and respect a ton, went off on a semester abroad program in New Zealand and came back totally transformed. Uh, mm. and, and I think the the climax of that transition that that sticks out so powerfully for me still to this day was when he told the family soon after he returned that because of his experiences in New Zealand studying at the intersection of ecology and biology and biblical studies and theology yep. because of his experience there he was now a vegetarian mm. uh, and <laughs> to my 17 year old midwestern ears at the time uh, when I was still in high school that was nonsense. I mean, I, I didn't know anybody like me who had ever made that choice, could not conceive of why anyone like me would ever make that choice. Uh, and so I, I was forced to, to choose between lumping my brother in with this caricature of vegetarianism, which was vaguely um, eco-terrorist, like throwing red paint on for coats on the weekend, w weird people, right. uh, or suspend those assumptions and hear him out. Mm -hmm. um, and thanks be to God, I, I was able to choose the latter and, and largely because he was so gracious and generous with his own experience and learning. And, and he, he walked me through what he learned, what he experienced and helped me see that his newfound commitment to caring for God's creation, uh, and, and one of the ways he chose to do that was by eating less meat, was not um, ancillary to the values that had been instilled in us by our Christian community. In fact, it was uh, an outflowing of those values. It was, it was connected directly to those values of love and compassion and mercy um, and pursuit of Christ's kingdom and love of neighbor that, that we had been taught. Um, it was precisely because of those values that he was making this choice. It's the first time I had ever had that explained to me in that way. And it, it sparked a fire in my spirit that was stoked as I went to Calvin College and, and took classes and professors and went to lectures uh, and met new friends, all of which um, continue to help me make those connections between my commitment to Jesus and the way I live in Christ's world. Hmm. Um, and, and all of those experiences culminated in, in me finding Young Evangelicals for Climate Action when I was a recent graduate from college, getting involved in a volunteer capacity and eventually coming on staff in 2016. Great. Wow. So that's, <laughs> did your brother aware the role that he had in, in shaping your career? 
He is. I, I get asked to tell my story in almost any interview sure, I yeah. give. Um, and so <laughs> he features prominently um, across media outlets uh, now, uh, <laughs> across all of the interviews that I've given. Um, yeah, so he's, he's aware and we talk about it often still. Yeah, that's great. Now, so now you have uh, you have roles with two organizations then that both have kind of a shared mission, uh, the Evangelical Environmental Network and Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Can you give us a, a little more background about what those organizations are and what they're hoping to accomplish and maybe what you do there? Sure. So the Evangelical Environmental Network is a, a national group of Christians across the country who understand exactly what I just articulated. They understand that their faith in Christ compels them to take care of God's creation um, and to advocate for policies that take care of, of God's creation, both because we are uh, commanded to do so in scripture for its own sake, and because of all of the ways that the degradation of the created world through pollution um, and, and other um, other environmental impacts directly affect our neighbor, our neighbor's health, well-being, their ability to thrive and flourish on the earth. Uh, and as Christians who are called to both love God and to love our neighbor, um, Jesus tells us those are the two most important things to concern ourselves with. To love God, uh, one of the ways we love God best is by honoring God's good works, the works that God himself calls good over and over and over again. Uh, works that scripture attests over and over that God cares about for its own sake. Um, and uh, called to love our neighbor, what better way to love our neighbor than to make sure that they have clean air to breathe and, and clean water to drink and a safe and stable climate where they can fl flourish and thrive. Uh, so the Evangelical Environmental Network seeks to educate the, the Christian church in the U.S. about how our faith compels us to um, that kind of living and those kinds of policies. And Young Evangelicals for Climate Action is essentially the youth engagement ministry of EEN. So YECA is, is a ministry of the Evangelical Environmental Network. And YECA is also a national group of young Christians aged 18 to 30 across the U.S., who are focusing in specifically on climate change and are uh, educating their peers, educating their church leaders, uh, and advocating with policymakers uh, for efforts that will uh, address the climate crisis at the speed and scale that's required. And again, all because we're trying to follow Jesus well in a warming world. We're trying to, to follow Jesus more closely in the 21st century. And for all the reasons I just explained, uh, many, many young Christians in the U.S. are looking around at the realities of climate change and saying, look, if I'm going to take the words of Jesus seriously uh, and try to honor God and try to love my neighbor, how can I do anything but uh, address this crisis that is threatening both God's good works and threatening my neighbor's livelihood. Right, right, yep. Uh, now, the the young part of young evangelical, but how do how do young people, this, you know, kind of college age and, and maybe recent college graduates, although not all college uh, students, I'm sure, but what, how do young people have a, a, a message that's unique to this, uh, to this topic? that we might hear something different or do, do you hear something different from them than, than we would speaking with uh, more aged people, uh, you know, in their 40s and 50s and 60s? Um, what, what is, what is the, the young part of young evangelicals signify? Or I, not, not what does it signify, but how is it unique? Sure. Well, one of the, the things that excites me the most about working with this group of, of young people um, is not only their energy and their passion, uh, you know, I think across the board, not just young Christians, but young people broadly are kind of the beating heart of the climate movement right now. Young people um, ha have really made a, a huge difference just in the last couple of years, moving climate change to the top of the national agenda, um, moving it up people's lists of priorities uh, when it comes to voting issues, uh, moving the window of what's possible policy-wise. Um, so young people have tons of energy and passion. 
Uh, I, I think what they also possess that's really, really important is a moral authority to call mm -hmm. leaders to account uh, because it is precisely their future that hangs in the balance. Mm -hmm. um, for many generations, climate change could be, and maybe for, for extremely old generations now, still can be a largely theoretical mm -hmm. discussion. Uh, for young people, it's existential. <laughs> we're, we're looking out at the horizon of some of the predictions from the internet, uh, the intergovernmental panel on climate change talking about, you know, if we don't uh, start cutting emissions drastically, then as early as 2030 uh, or 2040, we could start seeing catastrophic, irreversible impacts of climate change, impacts that we thought were decades off. Um, when I look at 2030, I'm looking at my 40, what is it? I'm looking at my 41st birthday. Um, so I'm going to be, I'm going to be, and I'm on the older end of this generation, right? Of this group of young people that we're working with. So most of the folks we're working with are looking at their, their thirties when some of these impacts start actually being felt. They're, they're looking at the majority of their lifetime, if they're lucky, you know, if they live to the, the expected age one can expect to live to in the US, they're looking at most of their life being lived under the shadow of catastrophic climate impacts. Right. That's scary. Uh, and, and it gives young people an authority, a moral authority to make demands on our leaders because it's not theoretical, mm -hmm. it is existential. Uh, and, and I think young people have that kind of authority and they're bringing it to bear in, in really powerful ways. I, I think one of the other things that young people have uh, that, that's really important and, and effective is they have their own leadership opportunities emerging ahead of them. One of the, the reasons I'm really excited to be investing in younger folks right now is not only to draw out the moral authority of their message with our uh, older leaders, but also to cultivate their leadership now so that as they prepare to step into leadership roles in the future, whether they are office holders or leaders in a church or denomination, if we can create a generation that has creation care embedded in their hearts, then that will come into their leadership as well. They will have creation, care, and climate action at the heart of their leadership uh, for an entire generation and generations to come. So young people are, are uniquely important to invest in, in my opinion, both because they have a unique moral authority to the demands that they make because of the ways that climate change is threatening their futures in a way that's not threatening older folks mm -hmm. and because it's a way of cultivating and discipling an entire generation of future leaders to have climate action at the heart of their leadership for decades to come right now i know this is a a, a big question but what why is it that older generations seem to be less concerned about this and i know that dissertations have been written on this and we could go on and on for hours and hours but it's you have a, a, a unique um, position that might be able to speak into that or for people that haven't you know read through some of the, the resources that are out there why, why do we see generational patterns and and concern about climate change and willingness to to do something about it yeah you're right. It's a really big question. And uh, there are experts who are much better equipped to answer it than, than me. So I'll do my best. Um, some, some answers that I, I think I've seen um, in my work is uh, one of them is what we just talked about, the theoretical versus the existential. I, I think for young people, it feels more visceral and more real than it does for older folks, especially older folks um, who spent much of their adult lives participating in uh, the, the public space of ideas where climate change was um, ignored, was marginalized, or, or was forecasted as this future problem. I think a lot of older people heard that and they internalized that because that was the conversation for a long time. This is a problem, but it's a problem for the future. Right. And we know that psychologically, uh, humans aren't good at dealing with big, complex problems that aren't in, an immediate threat. Right. Um, so, so I think that's part of it. 
I think another part of it is young people are more connected than ever before, especially to other parts of the world. So even though climate change and its impacts are visiting the US uh, more regularly than ever now in you know historic floods in the Midwest and um, stronger, more catastrophic hurricanes in the Gulf South and wildfires out West, it's not hard to see climate change here now. But uh, it's also a lot easier for younger people to not only see global climate impacts around the world, but it's more likely that young people will have a face and a name and a story and even a loved one to connect to those impacts. Um, young people are more well-traveled, they're more connected through social media, they have more friends around the globe. Um, so when, when we see our friends or someone who looks like our friend um, <laughs> going through catastrophic flooding in, in Bangladesh or, or in India or in East Africa, um, I think it's easier for young people to connect in a way that it's not as easy for older folks. Uh, and, and I think the third reason um, is, like I, I mentioned before, the conversation around climate change um, has been dictated, the terms of that conversation have been dictated in a particular way. And it's important for us, especially as Christians, to tell the truth about that history. And the truth mm -hmm. is, for decades, billions of dollars have been spent in a concerted disinformation campaign yeah. on the part of industries who stood to lose the most from transitioning away from fossil fuels to cleaner energy sources. We have documents going back to the 1980s that show that ExxonMobil knew that climate change was a threat. They understood the scope and the extent of it, and they sought to bury it. Um, and, and not for the purpose of uh, contradicting the science because that was impossible. Uh, the purpose was to confuse the public's understanding of the scientific consensus mm -hmm. uh, to muddy the waters so that they could have as much time as possible to milk the fossil fuel economy for all it's worth. Um, and we see that that campaign was wildly successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> it's wildly successful. And, yeah. and they took a page right out of the page. Uh, they took a page right out of the book of the tobacco industry in the 1960s, um, propping up uh, scientists who had credentials, just not in you know, the area of study that was most pertinent to climate change, or in that case, to lung health and um, the impacts of, of tobacco and cigarettes on human health. Um, confusing the public's understanding of the scientific consensus for a long time, the tobacco industry um, poured millions of dollars into perpetrating this, this lie that the, the scientists were not um, sure about right. yeah. cigarettes impact. So um, that's another reason why, because older folks have uh, been bombarded with these messages for decades. Uh, and a lot of evidence actually shows that evangelical Christians in particular were targeted um, with many of these messages. And the leaders, the evangelical leaders um, of the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, uh, in many ways were complicit with whether intentionally or unintentionally with that campaign to confuse people's understanding of the science and the scientific consensus. So it's unsurprising then that those generations feel confused right, um, and, right. and aren't as sure of the problem or as galvanized around action as younger folks are. Yep. Yeah, that's great. And, and there's a, um, you know, I think that I've, I've shared that message with students and they all look at me like, I, you know, I, I think it's worth exploring. There's a great uh, book that was turned into a, a documentary, Merchants of Doubt, which, mm -hmm. which goes through some of that. It's quite discouraging, but, but I think it's helpful to be aware that, that not all of this is just good natured, uh, you know, skepticism, but there is, right. there's money to be lost. And that's unfortunately people have, have invested financially in, 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 uh, in encouraging Christians and, and Americans to, to be skeptical of this, um, maybe without merit. So anyhow, yeah. uh, just a little recommendation there. So, um, you know, in, in your role at, for, the uh, YECA and the Evangelical Environmental Network. I imagine you're doing a lot of speaking and and writing and, and talking. And I, you know, uh, th this video that we recently published is talking about um, 
how we are searching for the right message, right? Uh, is it, how do we uh, convey the the nature of the the mandate that we see in the first page of the Bible to to steward creation, to have dominion over creation, to care for creation? I'm just curious: has your message changed? over time, both you individually and, and with the organizations that you're associated with, intentionally in response to how those different messages are taken in, or is it, are you sort of, um, or I, I guess, um, can, you, can you let us behind the scenes? Do you feel like there are certain messages that resonate more with different age groups or different, you know, church denominations or whether you're talking to a secular audience or a Christian audience, I'm just kind of curious, how, how do you convey this message and why do, you, why do you think we are having a hard time deciding the best way to communicate this, this really basic, really important idea? Yeah, certainly. There are certainly ways in which um, I and the, and the rest of YECA, lots of leaders who are doing a lot of teaching and leading across the country, yeah. um, a lot of ways that we tweak uh, our messaging depending on our audience. Uh, you know, one example is um, if we are presenting to um, a church, for instance, and it's well known that this church uh, is, is either divided on the question of the age of the earth, or it is a community where that kind of question is active. Um, and, and to to um, to communicate in such a way that doesn't recognize that would do a disservice yeah. to our message getting out there and, and finding fertile ground in their hearts. Um, we recognize that and, you know, we avoid charts that go past 6,000 years BC, mm. right? Because yep. you don't have to. The, the, the yeah. data since then is still compelling. Um, yeah. so, so just being smart uh, about who your audience is and how you're communicating, that kind of stuff is, yep. is certainly one example of how our message shifts and changes. But I actually don't think that the fundamental message changes all that much. And that's because we've, we've done a lot of learning on this and people like George Marshall uh, and Catherine Hayhoe and Jonathan Haidt um, have helped us understand this. But human psychology um, and kind of social sciences are pretty consistent across people, groups and, and in groups and out groups. And the evangelical church is no different in that people in the evangelical church and anywhere want to have their identities affirmed. Mm -hmm. They want to be communicated in such a way that they can see their values reflected and they want to belong. So our messaging always tries to be invitational. We try to create a community where people can belong and be themselves. We try to affirm who people already are and say, you don't have to change who you are. This is exactly consistent with who you already are, exactly like my brother did for me, right. saying, because of everything we were taught in our community, here's the invitation right. um, to live more deeply into that identity and to communicate in a way that, that people's values can be recognized in what we're calling them to do. <clears throat> so, for instance, a lot of climate messaging, especially for people in the church, sounds a lot like this. Um, here is something that you and nobody like you cares about, but we care a lot about it. Right. Um, here are all of the reasons why we care about it. Um, not you, but this is why we care about it. And here are all the things you have to change or stop doing. Everything that you like about who you are that you have to give up in order to do something about it. And if you do, you'll become less like the people around you and the people you love, and you'll become more like us. Yeah. Um, I don't care who you are. That's not compelling at all. I don't, right. I don't want to, I don't want to raise my hand to that. Yeah. So what we try to do is say, uh, these are all of the things that you love about who you are and your community. Um, and here are the values that define that community and how those values are connected to creation care and climate action. Mm -hmm. When you take action, you're going to join all of these other people, just like you, who are already doing this thing, and you're going to become a part of a community of like-minded folks who are working to make the world more like you want it to be. Um, that's a lot more compelling to me, at least, and I think to other people too. So 
we, we don't try to denigrate people's um, identities, but to affirm them and say, you already have everything you need as an evangelical Christian to care about this. Yeah. Um, here are the values like the authority of scripture, um, the sanctity of human life, um, our call to care for God's creation and to love the poor. Um, here's how all of those values that are part of that identity are also a part of taking action on climate change. Here are all of the people who are like you, our field organizers, our advocates, our fellows, our steering committee, other people who are connected with us across the country who are already standing up and living out those values um, that you can join. And, and here's the community that you can be a part of. And, and when you do, you become a part of uh, a really beautiful expression of Christ's kingdom um, here on this earth. And, and, and you become, uh, more a part of the community um, and the people that you love. Right, right. That's great. I, I think that's really interesting and, and fascinating insight that that I think, um, you know, the, there, there does tend to be some shaming, both from just the environmental group and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, around the world, but maybe uh, from Christians uh, as well um, with trying to, to guilt people into making the right decision, whether it's around creation care or really anything else. And we're, we're wise to use psychology, uh, yeah. put, put that on our sides and make sure that we're, that we are sharing a message that connects with people. Yeah. The, the negative framing around environmental conversations is ubiquitous, including yep. in the church. Um, it's almost always, you know, don't do this, sacrifice this, stop doing this. Yeah. Here's everything you'll lose. Um, and, and, uh, we need to flip that. We need to talk about everything we'll gain. We need to talk about the joy that we get by living more deeply into our values and into our commitment to God's world and, and loving our neighbor. Um, I, I often like to talk about, uh, creation care and climate action as part of our vocation. Hmm. Um, everybody has a unique vocation, right? Made up of a constellation of commitments and callings. I'm called to be a father, a husband. I'm called to do this organizing work with YCA, um, all kinds of callings on my life. But as a Christian, um, part of my calling is to be a steward of God's creation, uh, is to be someone who loves my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so when you frame it as vocation, then those, those opportunities to make lifestyle changes or to build a relationship with my member of Congress to try to advocate for policy uh, is not a reaction to, to someone blaming or shaming me, uh, because that's not sustainable. Uh, instead, it's um, a, a beautiful opportunity for me to live more fully into who God has called me to be, which is a lot more joyful, a lot more sustainable than fear and guilt and shame and blame. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Now, you also, uh, you wrote a, a wonderful chapter in a book that came out um, a year or two ago called Beyond Stewardship. And in that you advocated that we um, uh, at least consider adopting more of a, a kinship model when we look at our relationship with God's creation. Can you explain what that means and why you think that uh, that reframing might be a helpful approach to, to for Christians? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll uh, preface by saying that um, I'm deeply indebted to um, countless indigenous theologians um, mm -hmm. who have tread this ground before me. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not saying anything new, I don't think, yeah. um, but, but certainly, you know, look at indigenous theologians like Richard Twiss and Mark McDonald and Terry LeBlanc um, and Andrea Smith and others um, who are also making this case. Uh, basically, the, the argument that I was making is that a, a stewardship paradigm, or at least an exclusively stewardship paradigm, when it comes to how we think about our relationship to the natural world, has a lot of benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but it also has some drawbacks. And one of the main drawbacks is that it, it functions to it. it, it, it essentially distances us mm, from right. the natural world, yep. I think in unintended ways. Yep. Um, but a steward is not somebody who's necessarily in relationship with that which is steward. A steward um, is kind of over against the resource that's being stewarded. Um, 
and, and a steward often stewards resources, at least the way we talk about being stewards of creation tends to phrase it in ways that um, reduces the created world to inner resources, right? To be extracted and used responsibly. Um, but it's a, it's a relationship of management of resource instead of um, relationship with. Uh, and I don't think scripture lets us do that. I mean, the way that scripture talks about the natural world um, is um, much more uh, relational. Uh, creation um, in many ways is sacred. It's not divine, mm -hmm. um, but it, it is sacred because yeah, right. yeah. uh, God, the divine has created it. And so I think a stewardship mentality desacralizes the natural world. Um, in unhelpful ways. And yeah. so I think recovering um, the sacredness of the natural world, recovering our original call to be in relationship with the natural world, to recognize our embeddedness in the natural world. Yeah. I mean, one example that might seem trivial, but actually whenever I bring it up, a lot of people are usually surprised. One example is that in Genesis 1, when God creates human beings, God does it on the same day as he creates all of the other land creatures. Yeah. Um, I think it's easy for us to imagine that we had our own special creative day um, when God made image bearers separate and unique. Uh, God certainly made us in his image and that sets us apart in really important ways. But God did it alongside the badgers and the billy goats and the beavers <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because we are embedded in creation. We are creatures ourselves. Yep. Uh, and part of being creatures is to recognize a relationship with other creatures. And so kinship is a model that uh, in the art, in the, the chapter, um, I, I make the case uh, is biblical and can be an antidote, an antidote or a corrective to a mentality, a stewardship mentality that distances us from the natural world, that desacralizes the natural world, yep. that in many ways, um, in extreme cases, baptizes our abuse of the natural world, because as long as we can say, oh, we're, we're extracting this resource, quote unquote, responsibly, right, even if right. it's not to all take that. take care of ourselves. Yep, yep exactly. Um, I think it can be an antidote or a corrective to that mentality um, that, that I think can, can hopefully help the church enter into a new understanding of our relationship with the natural world um, that might be able to correct for some of the ways that we've neglected our responsibility to, to care for it. Right. That's great. I think that's a really valuable addition to, to, this, to this discussion, this debate. And I agree that something about the stewardship model, I, I think just because perhaps Christianity so often talks about stewardship and the framing of the way we use our, our money, right. that it just feels like it is a uh, you know that we that we treat nature as an, an inanimate object that that is merely something to be wisely used or or not used and has no sense for. Uh, I love the way you, you talked about it. it's not divine, but it's not merely just matter and a collection yeah. of atoms. It's 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 got its own unique um, uh, s sacred nature that are our dualisms don't really give justice to. Yeah, it's really yeah. I, I like the way that you said that. And it's, um, there is a, an inherent inner life to creation that has its own dignity um, that God grants it by calling it good over and over and over again before humans right. are ever there. Um, and, and all the ways that the Psalms and Job and other uh, scriptures show us the intimate relationship that God has with creation apart from human beings. Right. Um, so creation is not made for us. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, as Psalm 24 yeah. tells us. So a stewardship mentality, I think, like you said, um, understands creation as a resource to be used wisely, but it's always centered around human needs, mm. um, around human use, but that's not the point of creation. Creation has its own um, inner dignity and its own intimate relationship with the creator apart from human beings. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I, let's, if we can change directions a little bit, I, um, uh, I know that you recently were, uh, um, uh, 
uh, had this award, this fellowship through the Yale Institute of, of Climate Studies, where you're a public voice in the in the climate crisis. And I, I, I wonder, oh, I didn't prep you for this or much, but I wonder if you, is that uh, somewhere where you're integrating and, and um, speaking uh, about the climate crisis with secular voices? And I'm just kind of curious how people react to, to you and your role, because I think that um, in the mainstream scientific world, they, they have this stereotype of how Christians engage with climate just wondering what people make of you and your message and, mm -hmm. and how uh, the conversations you've had have maybe led to you know new opportunities to 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 collaborate and and conjoin our messages with those that come from secular science to uh, just reach a broader audience uh, that's a great question so for our, <laughs> as part of my fellowship with, uh, it's a, a joint fellowship with the op-ed project and the Yale program on climate change communication. Part of that fellowship is being in a cohort of 19 other fellows. So there's 20 of us. Um, in a non-COVID year, we would have been gathering in person yeah. every uh, three months, but we've been doing that online mm -hmm. and actually building really beautiful community anyway. Um, I am the only faith leader uh, in that cohort. A lot of other folks are scientists or people with experience in the government or activists in kind of the mainstream climate movement. Yep. Um, and I have had really great conversations and I think it, it maps onto my experience in this role across the last several years that I've, I've done this work. Uh, we find opportunity to be in non-faith-based climate spaces often. Um, so we are also a part of the U.S. Climate Action Network, which is the largest network of organizations working to address the climate crisis in the U.S. Um, many groups in that network are faith-based, many are not. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so in that network, as part of my fellowship, uh, I, I've found myself to be very welcomed, um, warmly welcomed, maybe more frankly than I feel I deserve, especially given the ways in which the evangelical community in particular um, has really failed in our calling in recent years to, to take this problem seriously and do our best to address it. Um, but I actually sense more than resentment, I sense um, gratitude uh, and, and eagerness to, to see us there and a part of the conversation yep. um, and to hear uh, a faithful faithful huh, a faithful faithful <laughs> yeah. uh, explanation of uh, why Christians are called to this work and right. why our faith informs our work um, in the same way that evangelicals in many ways have abdicated our responsibility to be a part of these conversations uh, media caricatures and, and, and other misunderstandings and misrepresentations of the ev evangelical community um, have also impacted the larger climate movement's understanding of what Christians believe and, and how Christians approach this issue. So I'm actually very grateful for opportunities to build relationships with people in the larger climate movement um, and to help them understand uh, how um, Christian theology can ground a robust call to climate action um, mm -hmm. and how the Christian tradition throughout the centuries um, is actually perfectly in step with the kind of kind of advocacy and activism that we're trying to do here. Um, so I've, I've found a lot of receptivity, a lot of gratitude, um, and have, have built a lot of meaningful relationships and made a lot of important friends. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, and, and encouraging to hear from the Christian side of things too, you know, that people are welcoming and, and receptive to to your policy. I mean, I, I don't think it should be a surprise. You know, we we see the voices of people like E.O. Wilson and, and others that have reached out to Christians and said, look, we really need you on board. And so I, I, I think those are uh, exciting opportunities to see um, people from the secular world that might not share the same faith commitment, but want to reach out with us and collaborate with us to, to um, effectively get this, this message across. Yeah, right. Uh, so um, to change directions again a, a little bit and maybe step away from the uh, climate and environmental side of the science and faith, uh, you know, it seems 
I read in, in one of your bios, but also just from our discussion, it's clear that you've got a, a, a fairly um, a comfortable relationship in integrating science and faith. And disciple science is all about trying to connect people to God through God's creation. And I think science is an important part, an important way we can do that. And I just am curious, is this something that you were always comfortable with or was this um, a process where, where you had to do, you know, sort of some wrestling or deconstruction in order to see harmony between uh, your clearly evangelical faith and desire to share the good, you know, the story of the gospel with people and with your understanding of the world through the lens of science? Yeah, great question. Um, I think I'll answer it in two ways. One is to say, yes, deconstruction was absolutely necessary, um, but it was not a deconstruction of the idea that science had nothing to do with my faith and science couldn't inform my faith. It was more a deconstruction of how I understood the gospel and how I understood um, my faith as an impetus for action. Uh, yeah. So I grew up in a community that was actually quite comfortable integrating science and faith. Uh, hmm. The reformed tradition broadly um, is usually quite comfortable integrating science into our understanding of God and God's world in our place in it. Um, the Christian Reformed Church, where I grew up and am ordained, um, is certainly um, no exception to that. Um, but most of my deconstruction had to do, like I said, with my understanding of who I thought God was, especially in relation to God's world. Um, yeah. And, and uh, because I was a religion major at Calvin, I had a lot of opportunities to do that deconstruction. <laughs> um, the, the reconstruction was the hard part, um, but it's groups like Young Evangelicals for Climate Action um, that helped me do that reconstruction and, and going to seminary, frankly, was, was an important part of that process too. Um, when it comes to actually integrating faith with science, and this is the second way I'll answer it, um, that was certainly a process for me. Uh, I was not a hard science major in college. Like I said, I was a religion major. I was in the humanities and then I went to seminary. Um, so the science aspect was certainly something I learned on the job. Um, and uh, it was a learning curve. And uh, I'm certainly not an expert in the minutia of the, the science in ways that my colleague at EEN, Jessica Mormon, for instance, is PhD paleoclimatologist, brilliant mind. Um, I can wax eloquent about the theology, um, but the the science part um, was a process and it is a process. It's still a process, um, but I'm, I'm grateful for, for people who have uh, walked alongside of me and, and helped me um, integrate that more and more over time. That's great. Um, so do you um, have uh, recommendations for people that might be wrestling? You know, we, Disciple Science wants to be a, a ministry that provides that you know, metaphorical bridge to help people maybe that are in some stage of deconstruction. And I, you know, I'm a, I'm a reader and I, my, I kind of did my deconstruction solo, unfortunately. I didn't have a mentor to guide me through that. But I wondered, are there books that you recommend? Are there books that you just give out to people because you think they do such a great job of, of either, you know, um, dealing with the climate issue and how Christians can engage with that, but also just science and faith in general? Yeah. So anything Catherine Hayhoe writes is great. Yeah. We, we always recommend Catherine's book, <laughs> Climate for Change. It's hard to get your hands on. Yeah. I, hope, I hope they're doing another print. Um, they certainly should be. But that's, that's up there, absolutely. Um, any of her global weirding videos right. uh, on YouTube, if you, mm -hmm. if you Google global weirding, she has yeah, a whole those are series. fantastic. Yep. Yeah, a series on YouTube. Um, so really, really appreciate the way that Catherine integrates faith and science in that way. Um, on the, the theology side, uh, I would recommend N.T. Wright's Surprised by Hope. Um, I think, <laughs> that I think, book was transformative for me. It just absolutely. helped me understand the nature of what it means to talk about, you know, the gospel and going to heaven and our, our vision for the, our, our hope for reality, right? Our, our hope for the future. Such yeah. a good, a great book. 100%. It's yeah. consistently, I think it's my all-time top three books. Um, life top three books. So certainly that in, in terms of, just like you said, understanding um, 
what our hope actually is. Is our hope escaping to heaven in another dimension or is our hope life on this earth again, yeah. uh, on this renewed earth? Um, uh, I would recommend, oh, now I'm blinking. I got too excited about NT, right? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I would recommend um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Oh yeah. Yep. That is another one um, that just, <laughs> I've rarely read a book that's made me weep so often, but mm -hmm. just the sheer beauty of the vision that she casts for what our relationship with the natural world could actually look like. And because she's a trained botanist and a poet and a Potawatomi woman, yeah. she weaves together her indigenous heritage and wisdom with her botanist scientific training and just her gift for language in a way that um, is, it's also one of my life top three books, I think. Yeah. My, my wife read that one and she's like, you, you got to read this. This is just this, you got to, it's, it's, yeah, it's really a, a great one. I yeah. appreciate that. I, I, uh, you know, it's been just a pleasure to have you on Kyle. Thanks for your, uh, your taking the time out of, out of your schedule to come on, but also just thanks for your work in being a, a representative to vocally get out there and say, those of us who are excited to tell the story of the gospel and evangelize, you know, what we think is great news are also really passionate to, to get out there and, and, um, and play an active role in, in caring for creation and, and taking care of things when we, when we see, the, see things going wrong, like we do with the climate. So I'm yeah. uh, really appreciative of, of your work and the work of YECA and the Evangelical Environmental Network. So we'd love well, to have thank you on. You, Dale. Yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the work that you're doing. We always try to plug Disciple Science whenever we can. We love, we love what you're trying to do and what you are doing. Yeah. Um, one more suggestion for folks, sure. um, if you're interested in getting plugged in with YECA, you can head to yecaction.org or just Google Young Evangelicals for Climate Action, you'll find us. Um, you can sign our um, call, to, call to action, sorry, our faithful <laughs> climate. <laughs> um, you can sign our commitment um, to become a part of our community. That gets you on our mailing list. Um, that gets you in our, our network so that you can yeah. get updates on action alerts and, and other ways to be involved. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and actually, and let me just give you another opportunity to plug. What, what are you up to next? Is there a place where people can find you and um, or, you know, there are suggestions for how to get involved aside, you know, getting on the mailing list for YCA and, and EN? Yeah, sure. So we we just finished one of our, our major campaigns, uh, which lasted all election season. Um, we had a big civic engagement campaign where we were uh, connecting with young voters, uh, trying to get them the tools they needed to get registered um, if they weren't, and, and encouraging them if they were to make sure they voted with the climate in mind mm -hmm. um, and for candidates who would protect our future. Um, we, we just finished that, uh, we, we contacted over 200,000, um, young voters in several states across the country. Um, and right now we're, we're doing a little bit of vision casting and dreaming as well. Um, we're actually going to be going through a leadership transition. I will be phasing out, um, Tori Goebel, who is amazing, is going to be coming on as the new national organizer. Okay. Um, and it's also time to, to revamp our strategic plan. So we're actually taking a little bit of a breather right now, um, but we'll be back really soon with more opportunities to get involved. Great. All right. Well, I'll be uh, sure to plug those and let people know when, when those come online. And uh, again, uh, I, we've got a, uh, uh, a video on climate change in the works. So perhaps we can have you on again at some point in the future. So cool. Sounds good, Dale. Thanks so much. Yep. Thank you. All right.